think it's time to start. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Welcome here at Tech Nation 2022. And over the next, well, half hour or so, I'm going to basically tell you how virtual and augmented technologies, augmented reality technologies, can be used for other things than gaming. Namely to make, can you still hear me? Great. Basically to make training and work easier. That's going to be my topic today. So my name is uh, Saskia Groenewegen, and I've actually been doing uh, virtual reality for like a very long time. Since my student days in Germany, um, I first encountered VR when I was working at like a, as a student at a research institute, where a lot of like, early research uh, on VR was happening. It was called Fraunhofer. Um, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so then I decided to get another degree, just focusing on VR and AR. And then I came to the Netherlands, and here I also got the opportunity to work with some uh, VR researchers at TNO and at uh, TU Delft. And, and I worked at Utrecht University on a project that was actually called Metaverse <laughs> already a long time ago. Um, yeah, then I switched to industry R&D. And for the last almost five years, I've been working at uh, Ordina as a software architect and as a tech lead of the um, VR and AR or XR team. And here you can see some pictures of my work. Uh, you can see it's like very diverse. Like sometimes we're like on a high voltage station. Sometimes we're among the cows. Actually, a cow has been trying to eat my hardware once. <laughs> and sometimes I give talks like today. Um, and since about a year, I'm also an MVP for Microsoft for mixed reality. So that's a bit about me. <laughs> and um, so at Ordina, my company, there's uh, one team, my team, that mainly focuses on immersive te technologies. And we call that extended reality or XR. And we've been actually doing this for a very long time, uh, since 2014. And the last eight years, we've done over 50 projects for all kinds of clients, industry, government, defense, healthcare, education. Um, we're part of the Microsoft unit because everything we do is programmed in uh, C Sharp and using the Unity game engine. Maybe some of you have heard about that. Um, but what exactly is uh, extended reality of XR? Well, it's basically, um, it's three core technologies, you could say. It's virtual reality, it's mixed reality, and it's augmented reality. So virtual reality basically completely replaces the real world, the simulated world. Right? You put on those VR glasses and you completely step into a different environment. You can do, uh, see two uh, examples here, very popular games with Beat Saber and a job simulator. And technology for that is like from like super simple with like your phone and a cardboard to like room scale setups with haptics and smell and everything. So VR is not just the visual aspect, but it's also those other things, like everything that kind of stimulates your senses. You can say that's part of um, this virtual reality to make it even more real, basically. Um, then we have augmented reality. Um, with augmented reality, you can still see the real world. Um, usually people use phones or tablets for that, um, and you project information on top of the real world. And here we see examples like the IKEA app, where you can uh, like check if the IKEA furniture will fit in your living room. Another very popular example is Pokemon Go, you know, where you see little Pokemons appear in your real world. Um, so yeah, phones, tablets, but also like Google Glass is also an example of uh, augmented reality, I would say. And then the last thing is mixed reality, uh, which is very similar to augmented reality because you also still see the real world um, and you get extra information. But those glasses have a huge amount of sensors, so they know way more about the real world than your phone. And that means as a result, um, yeah, you can interact with those virtual objects way more intuitively. They're also like stereoscopic, so they like appear in 3D in front of you. And you can do things like, I don't know, you have a virtual coffee cup and you take your real hand, you take your virtual coffee cup, you put it on the real table, and all of that is possible because, uh, well, because those glasses know so much about your um, <coughs> environment. And so interaction this way is way more intuitive than um, using a phone, basically. Just get a sip. So the question is, what does this all have to do with uh, our favorite buzzword, the metaverse? <laughs> well, 
Well, real quick, uh, the metaverse, of course, was not invented by Facebook, despite what many people might think. Uh, it was a term coined in the early 90s by a, a science fiction author, Neil Stevenson, in his novel Snow Crash. And he used it to basically describe, um, yeah, what, what we also sometimes call cyberspace, right? Some kind of world-spanning, um, game-like uh, world, uh, successor to the internet, you could say, populated by avatars, uh, that is often um, accessed through VR glasses. And today, this term metaverse is actually, yeah, it's used to describe so many things. Like, yeah, you can, people say the metaverse is um, game worlds like Minecraft, Fortnite, <coughs> sorry, um, social XR spaces like Facebook Horizon, Old Space VR, um, annotated real spaces like the AR cloud. <coughs> Um, and also things like industrial digital twins, which is like IoT-based digital copies of the real world. All of this uh, is called metaverse. Um, but in general, you can say it's, um, it's any virtual space with some degree of believability where people can work and play and socialize, and that is commonly accessed through XR technology. So that's how it all fits into this talk. So, uh, so you basically now you have a bit of an overview over the technologies. Um, there's a lot of gaming going on in that space, but, but um, at Ordina, um, we don't develop XR solutions for games. Um, we basically, we mainly um, use it for two purposes. <coughs> um, helping people to learn and train and uh, supporting people at work. And we're not the only ones. Um, you can say overall, you can see a bit of a shift in this, uh, in this industry from games to more enterprise-focused solutions. For example, you have a couple of hardware manufacturers that over the last uh, couple of years have come out with enterprise-focused headsets. You have like Microsoft, the new HoloLens. You have uh, Google has an enterprise edition of the glass. The Vive Pro, sorry, not, not the latest, but there's like a, a couple of headsets that are really built for enterprise. And even like the Oculus Quest, which is like really a gaming headset, has a business edition. So, so there's really a lot going on in the enterprise sector, let's say. And the reason for this is that there are many benefits um, by using immersive technologies for industry. And why? Well, to see that, basically we have to take a, <coughs> take a little step back and look at the situation on the labor market. Like despite a corona, We've experienced economic growth in the Netherlands in recent years. And that means, basically, we need more employees to do all of that work. But we also have population aging, which means many people are retiring, and we're losing their knowledge, and we're losing their workforce. Second thing, um, more and more people, especially technical people, are doing very specialized work, which means they're not as broadly, um, well, you can't, they can't do a such broad, uh, broad work anymore, but they're super specialized. And the last thing is, um, there's not enough young people. Like there's not enough young people doing technical um, educations. Um, a big Dutch company, ASML, they did a study that um, basically soon they will need every year as many engineers, new engineers as graduate in the whole country. So that's a big problem. And basically, if you want to sum it up, you have a shortage of people. Because we have to do you know, more with fewer people, and the people we have have to do broader activities, um, although they're specialists. And how do we solve this? Well, keyword here uh, is making people more sustainably employable. And uh, this is the point where VR and AR technologies can help. Because we see a number of advantages um, from using VR and AR on, uh, in the workplace. Uh, for example, you can build realistic training environments. You can make knowledge easier accessible by using AR glasses. You can make people more widely employable also by using uh, glasses with, may with maybe a video connection to colleagues. I'll get into the details later. It becomes easier to collaborate 
also remotely really important in times like a pandemic. It also often makes work more personal and fun through technologies like gamification. And all of those things in the end lead to saving costs and saving times for companies. So this is what we can gain. The question is, how do we get there? Um, and we see um, you can broadly um, do basically two things. You can support people during training, like before they start working, and you can put support people while they're already working. And we find that um, the most used technology for training is virtual reality for, uh, we call it immersive learning. And for, so to support people during their actual work, the most often used technologies are augmented and mixed realities, um, also called performance support. So this was a bit of the theory. <laughs> now, the next topic is, um, well, I want to show you what this means in practice on base, the basis of some use cases and some projects that we did at Ordina for our customers. So everything we're going to show you has been programmed in C Sharp and using the Unity uh, game engine, which is uh, uh, widely used in the XR world and basically based on uh, C Sharp. OK, let's start with virtual reality. And this is a ship of the Royal Navy that's deployed in the Caribbean. And that means if a new crew needs to be trained for the ship, what happens now is the ship has to come back to the harbor, sits there for two weeks while the new, tr the new crew trains on that ship. So what can we do to improve that? What we did is basically built a digital copy in virtual reality of the ship and its systems. We call it uh, a, well, a digital twin. And then basically you have all those buttons. And all of those buttons, and there are like three, uh, three of those systems, work exactly the same way as they work on the real ship. Like if you press one, then I don't know, the hatch opens and stuff like that. Which means the people who work, need to work on the ship can now train way before they ever see the real ship. And it's actually, it's amazing how efficient that is. Like we had never seen the real ship actually, built this project. And then went on the real ship, and we like knew everything. I was like, "Oh, I've seen this before." Like, and then, and then, and the people who they, they used to have like I don't know half an hour training for this on the real ship, like very little time, like a big group, and and now they can really train at home or you know at uh, at work. So they get way more efficient. To get ahead of myself, here's a list, <laughs> a list of all the the benefits. Like um, in general, you can use digital twins. Um, to train systems that are either difficult to access because they're not there or dangerous. Think of high voltage systems or, or fire um, training. You can train earlier, you can train more often, you can work from anywhere. Yeah, train dangerous or expensive situations, like I said. Um, and this realistic training just increases the efficiency of the people a lot. So let's move on to a completely different project. Um, this is a virtual training environment that we built for nursing students who are going to be working in a military environment and who are usually just training in regular hospitals. Um, so, and this is now actually an integral part of their school curriculum, so it's actually really used in their, their schools and it helps them to learn uh, things like triage, uh, clinical reasoning, like other stuff they have to learn in their um, education, but what it also does it puts them in a situation that they would usually never encounter during their training, which is a field hospital in a war zone. And this way they are much better prepared um, for their real work. 
because one big problem is of those people is that when they actually get deployed at some point after their um, education, they stop because it's such a shock often to them, like how the real situation is. And that's what we're trying to well, help with this. I'll show you some pictures. So you see a bit uh, of the environment. You can uh, talk to some avatars. You have to then choose which patient needs your help the most. And then actually you have to figure out what's, what's wrong with the patient. It's part of the game. You collect all kinds of information, talk to them. And they have like, wounds that don't happen in real hospitals. Like one of them has been shot and the other one has like a, um, like a, no leg anymore. Yeah, once you've, well, this is a bit like, technical, but then once you've collected all the information, then you can have to make some decisions as part of the game. But let me show me, you some video of uh, how this actually looks like at the education site. Reality Werkgroep van Landsteden. Samen met Ordina hebben wij de game Virtual Reality en de militaire zorg ontwikkeld. We merken dat het enorm helpt om de intrinsieke motivatie bij de studenten te vergroten. Ahead of Change spreekt ons natuurlijk als onderwijsinstelling erg aan, want wij willen ook graag op kop lopen in de onderwijsontwikkeling. En dat proberen wij met onze werkgroep Mixed Reality te doen. Dat geeft ons een hele grote digitale voorsprong, met dank aan Ordina. They built this whole, whole VR uh, lab with, I think, 16 stations, just so the students can train um, as part of the education. It's really cool, I think. And then here's actually our latest extension to that game, because we keep uh, make, making it bigger. Um, here, the user is transporting a wounded soldier to the hospital. And the patient is deteriorating quickly. And you have to make like really quick decisions to save him. And once at the hospital, then you, uh, you hand him over to medical staff. Luisteren naar een mist overdracht. Yeah, and then you made it, and then you pass them over to the to the doctors, basically. So yeah, that was a really fun project to do, also for us. So let's uh, let's move on to something else. Um, this is an example of remote collaboration, or collaboration in general. Um, imagine you have different people in different locations or different countries, and you want them to work together. And this is a project we built for the Melkkamer, North Nederland, the Dutch Emergency Services. Um, as a briefing tool, because they get a lot of information. It's like the people that you, when you call 112, uh, they pick up the phone, basically. So they need an overview over what's happening in the country and what can influence like the movement of the emergency um, services, like the weather or a traffic jam or, or other stuff. And so they get a lot of data that based on that they have to make decisions. And they used to get that on paper or as text. And you can imagine it's difficult to visualize all that information together. So, and that's why we built this system, uh, which is basically um, a giant table, because that's what they wanted, um, with a map of the Netherlands. And then you can plug in all kinds of data sources on that. Like here you can see like the position of the units. Oh, yeah, you can also draw on it. It's a bit like Google Maps <laughs> in 3D. Um, but yeah, it's not the greatest video, I apologize, but basically imagine you can just plug in data sources and then you can see the traffic and the weather. And, and this way they can make decisions um, much better because of this visual connection of, of multiple data sources together. And they can work together from the same location, like here, or it can also be com somewhere completely different. And they see each other as little avatars. Um, that system can be used for operation, but also for education. Like imagine you can teach new people to uh, like how to work in that kind of situation. And uh, especially the interactive data visualization helps people to understand the information much better. And because they can work remotely, uh, there's less travel. So you have, you know, it's good for the environment, less CO2, less uh, driving cars. So all kinds of benefits. So that was my part on virtual reality. Let's move on uh, to a bit of mixed reality and we build most things based on the Microsoft HoloLens. Um, this is a HoloLens app that guides 
technicians to repairs. Uh, so that the technician doesn't have to know all the details. Because uh, sometimes like companies like Aliander, they often they buy their competition, and then they they have like all kinds of technical systems that are kind of similar, but not the same. And it costs a lot of money to um, to educate all their um, mechanics to work with the, those systems. Um, so using those glasses, uh, they don't need that anymore. They can just do like a base um, education, and then the glasses will basically de detect the system you're standing in front of and give you all the extra information you need. <laughs> Tenzij de meekijken optie kan kennis op afstand worden ingeschakeld. Dit maakt effectief oplossen van de scoren mogelijk en voorkomt onnodige reisbewegingen. De motor te plaatsen of niet de inbreng van de storing door de real-time schakelschema bij te pakken. Hij heeft hiermee een actueel beeld van het verstoorde gebied en de geraakte assets. Vervolgens de handleiding op het te bedienen apparaat. De monteur houdt zijn handen vrij en kan de gewenste informatie zien terwijl hij doorgaat met het oplossen van de storing. De expert op afstand kan aanvullende instructies geven op basis van wat hij te plekken ziet. Yeah, apologies that this movie was only in Dutch. <laughs> but basically, so the, the, the system guides the mechanic through the repairs, uh, which means he also like, makes less mistakes. Um, and when in doubt, he can contact uh, a colleague who is somewhere else um, to help him. And the benefit of that is, well, basically what they used to do before using those glasses at Aliander is send two people, like one more experienced person and a junior person. Um, and the experienced person then would support the junior person or help um, with, uh, you know, when the person was still learning. And now the more, the more inexperienced person basically can go alone. And um, if there's a problem, can then contact their, um, their colleague and that colleague can support say 10 people at a time which again saves, uh, well, self saves people to, uh, or they can do like more work. Yeah, it's also like they're basically, they are usually quicker with their repairs because they make fewer mistakes because the system supports them. Yeah. And uh, this is again, <laughs> talking about cows. So this was a project for, for cows. Um, Nadab is a company that makes software for farmers. Um, and that software collects all kinds of data about the cows. Um, things like how did the cow eat enough? Um, is the cow well? Is the cow pregnant? All kinds of data. And um, well, they used to have this all in like some kind of backend system that you could access with your phone. But in a cow shed, you don't really want to touch your phone all the time because it's quite dirty. <laughs> um, and also, um, well, say you have like 500 cows um, using those AR glasses it's much more intuitive to get the data just like projected like in the air in uh, above the cow. Say so, like, like uh, you can just walk up to a cow and the, the because the, the cows actually wear kind of GPS trackers. So, so you know exactly where each cow is. So you can connect the data to the cow. So you can just walk to that animal and immediately see the right information with the right animal. You can interact with the data just with your hands. Like you can also add new information and stuff. And yeah, and this makes it makes the whole interaction way more intuitive and more efficient. Also a little video about this one.
That was uh, augmented reality for cows. And the last thing I want to show you, it's more like a little tech demo that we're working on. Um, the idea here is um, placing annotations in, in space. Um, why do we want to do that? Um, imagine you're a technician. You enter a, a room that you've never been at, and maybe your colleagues worked there yesterday, and that colleague then placed all kinds of information in the room. Like, and, and, and so with one glance, you can immediately see where every system is, um, what it's doing, what's the status, all kinds of data, and basically you can get to work way faster. And that's why we basically, as we started building this little tech demo, um, where you can, without using any markers, um, place basically annotations in space to work towards that use case. And it works on a HoloLens, but it also works on a phone. Should, should be seeing, yeah. So you can also just like from a phone, uh, with a phone just um, see what's happening, which is very useful. And also brings me to my next topic, which is phones. Because like the HoloLens is awesome, but it's also really expensive. It's like three and a half thousand euros. Um, and not everyone has one, but everybody has a phone. And sometimes you don't need all those spatial capabilities of 3D objects and everything. Sometimes a phone is enough. Also phones are getting better and better at that. So often we built an augmented reality application on a phone, like this one. Um, again, for Aliander. Um, the idea here is you're a technician and you have there's a malfunction, malfunction on this high voltage station and you have to solve it. So what do the technicians do at the moment without, without uh, AR? Um, they go um, into a house, there's like a giant closet they have to, where they have to find like a book, open the book and search in the book like which other book do they actually need for that um, whatever is broken, find that other book. So anyway, it takes a lot of time to get the information they need before they can even start working on the actual thing. And this AR is trying to solve that. Because based on a technology from Microsoft called Spatial Anchors, we again can detect objects um, without placing any markers, which means the technician just has to walk outside on the high voltage station, look at their phone, and the phone will guide them to the correct object, and then immediately also give them all the information about that object, like the history of malfunctions, are there any hazardous materials to take uh, care of, stuff like that. Um, let me show you the video. So this actually started as a research project to when, when the spatial anchor technology came out to see how well that would that would work. But like I said, it leads to all kinds of, of benefits. Right? You're as a, again as a as a mechanic, you're less dependent on specialists. The app will help you. Uh, you know better what security measures will will be needed. You're safer and you are much quicker usually uh, making those repairs. So that was my last example. Let's conclude. There are a lot of benefits <laughs> of using XR technologies for education, training, and work, right? We saw we save, can save time and costs. People can work more efficiently, more safe. It's easier to gain insights through data visualization. You can work hands-free, um, which is important, especially for mechanics, right? If you, you need both of your hands a lot of the times. You can work location independently, collaborate remotely. It's easy to repeat a training with like the VR um, ship, uh, even if the ship is not there. Um, 
it makes work more eco-friendly because there's less travel. And a lot of the time, people tell us it's really fun to work this way. Just to sum up, what would, did we want to achieve? Well, make people more sustainably employable. Difficult word. I don't haven't come up with a better one yet, so <laughs> give me feedback. Um, but we do this by supporting people during their training and education and during their work. And for training, we mostly use immersive learning with virtual reality. And for work, we often, but not always, use um, mixed and augmented reality for performance support. So I'd like to close my presentation with a little showreel of our work, and then I'll be very happy to answer your questions. So this is my email, this is our website. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>